Hello and welcome to the revision video for Religion, Crime and Punishment. This is for paper 2 which is the themes paper of AQA Religious Studies B and it's theme E. Before we start we'll just go through a few admin points. If when I'm talking you see on the screen a pen that looks like this one then it just means that you need to be writing something down. If you see the pause button like this one then it just means that you could pause the video and take a little bit more time over the slide that's on. Of course you can pause the video at any point during the video and if you see something like this that tells you how many minutes you need to spend on something that means we're practicing an exam question and you need to spend that amount of time on it to make sure that you give the most accurate impression for what you'll do in your exam. First thing we're going to do is go through some keyword definitions. As I go through I want you to write down the keyword that you think goes with each definition. This is obviously really important because the keywords give you access to all of the questions. If you see a question with a keyword in it and you're not able to define the keyword, you're not going to be able to answer the question. So remember, write down the word that goes with each one of the definitions. The first one is an action done which is against the law. Number two, a punishment given where the criminal is physically harmed for the crime they committed, for example, whipping. Number three, a punishment given where the criminal is killed for the crime they have committed, for example a lethal injection. Number four, a custodial punishment where criminals are locked up away from the rest of society. Number five, unpaid work for the community given as a punishment to criminals. This will be a set number of hours. Number six, showing mercy and pardoning someone when they have done wrong. Number seven, a possible cause of crime when someone is extremely poor. Number eight, this is a cause of crime when someone is reliant on a particular substance such as drugs or alcohol who would find it very difficult to stop taking it. Number nine, a possible cause of crime, a condition that affects a person's thinking, feeling or mood. Number ten, this is a crime committed against a person because of their race, gender, sexuality, religion or a disability. Number 11. This is a crime against property when the property of one person is taken by another. Number 12. A crime against a person where one person deliberately takes the life of another. Number 13. An aim of punishment that takes revenge on the criminal for the crime committed. Number 14. The idea that all life is sacred and special as it has been given by God. Number 15. An aim of punishment that should put people off committing crimes in the first place or committing them at all. Number 16. An aim of punishment where the punishment is given in order to change the person for the better so that they can become a part of normal society again. Number 17. This is a law in place in a country that people see as unfair. Number 18. The idea that an action is right if it encourages maximum happiness for the maximum number of people affected by it. Okay, grab a different coloured pen and make sure that you've got each one of these answers right. Mark them as we go through. So an action done which is against the law is a crime. A punishment given where the criminal is physically harmed for the crime they have committed, for example whipping, is corporal punishment. A punishment given where the criminal is killed for the crime they have committed, for example lethal injection, is either the death penalty or capital punishment. Remember the difference between corporal punishment and capital punishment. Corporal punishment is harming someone but not killing them. Capital punishment is killing them. A custodial punishment where criminals are locked up away from the rest of society is prison. Unpaid work for the community given as a punishment to criminals, this will be a set number of hours, is community service, also known as community payback. Showing mercy and pardoning someone when they have done wrong is forgiveness. A possible cause of crime when someone is extremely poor is poverty. This cause of crime when somebody is reliant on a particular substance such as drugs or alcohol, they find it very difficult to stop taking it, addiction. A possible cause of crime, a condition that affects a person's thinking, feeling or mood, mental illness. 
This is a crime committed against a person because of their race, gender, sexuality, religion or disability. A hate crime. This is a crime against a property when the property of one person is taken by another. Theft. A crime against a person where one person deliberately takes the life of another. Murder. An aim of punishment which takes revenge on the criminal for the crime committed. Retribution. The idea that all life is sacred and special because it's been given by God. The sanctity of life. A aim of punishment that should put people off committing crimes in the first place or committing them at all. Deterrence. An aim of punishment where the punishment is given in order to change a person for the better so that it can become a part of normal society again. It's reformation. A law in place in a country that people see as unfair is an unjust law. The idea that an action is right if it encourages the maximum happiness for the maximum number of people affected by it is the principle of utility. The first thing we need to look at is one of our key rules. This one we can look at across two different religions and it's slightly different in each one. The first one is a Christian one and it's from the Ten Commandments. It's a very simple one of do not kill. This means that you should never kill under any circumstances. The second is from the Quran and it says do not kill unjustly. This means that you cannot kill without a just reason. I want you to use both teachings to give contrasting views on the use of capital punishment to punish offenders. Try to write PEE paragraphs and think about how each one could go for one side of the argument. Pause the video now and write two PEE paragraphs on that. So we need to look at what crime is before we start to look at how people see crime. Crime is any action done which is against the law. Now it's really important to remember that it's not just a bad action, it needs to be something which is against the law of the country that you are in. So I'm going to go through a few different examples of crime. As I go through, make sure you've got a definition of that example of crime and either a Muslim or a Christian view on what that is and what that Muslim or Christian view would mean in terms of the crime, why it would be a bad thing to commit that crime. The first one we need to look at is murder. This is killing another person deliberately. And we've got some really obvious views that we could give in terms of Muslim and Christian views against murder. The first one is from the Quran, so it's an Islamic view. And the Quran says, if you've killed one man, it's as if you've killed the whole of mankind. This is telling us that Allah will not treat people well on the day of judgment if they've killed one person. It's in fact so serious that if you kill one person, he'll judge you in the same way as if you've killed the whole of mankind. In terms of the Christian view, we've got that very simple teaching from the Ten Commandments of do not kill. This very clearly is a commandment from God that tells people that they shouldn't kill others, and so murder would be completely wrong. The next type of crime that we need to know about is a hate crime. Hate crimes are crimes committed because of the gender, sexuality, race, or some other difference about the person that the crime is committed against. In terms of religious views against this, then all that we need to look at are religious views that tell us that everybody is equal and should be treated equally, and that will tell us that doing anything different to them, discriminating against them in any way, and particularly committing hate crimes against them, would be the wrong thing to do. So both of our religious teachings that we've got here basically mean that. The first one is a hadith that says Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, we are all as equal as the teeth on a cone. This suggests that everybody is absolutely equal, because all of the little teeth on a comb are absolutely equal. The second is a Christian view from St Paul, and it says there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Jesus Christ. We've got this very clear suggestion that every Christian is absolutely equal in the eyes of God. The final type of crime that we need to look at is theft. Theft is taking the belongings of someone else without any permission. In both Christianity and Islam, we've got very specific teachings which go against theft. The first one from Islam is from the Quran. As for the thief, male or female, cut off their hand. The Quran specifies punishment for thieves in particular, and it's very harsh, suggesting that it's absolutely against God to steal the belongings of others. From Christianity, we've got another one of the Ten Commandments, which is do not steal. Again, a very simple statement of what God wants from you and what he does not allow you to do. Time for our first keywords test. 
I want you to give me the definition of corporal punishment. Corporal punishment is punishment given where the criminal is physically harmed for the crime they have committed. For example, whipping. We now need to look at another one of our key rules. This is a Christian and a Muslim teaching and it's the golden rule. This means that you should treat other people the way that you want to be treated. I'd like to know how this teaching could affect the way that religious people believe that criminals should be punished. Pause the video now and use the golden rule to explain your answer to that question. The next thing we need to do is look at the causes of crime. Things that are behind the reasons why people commit crimes. Make a spider diagram on your piece of paper with the possible causes of crime in the middle of it and use the pictures on the screen to try and give some suggestions as to why criminals may become criminals. With each one, give a brief explanation as to how it would make somebody a criminal. The first one we'll look at is upbringing. Now this could be about your parents or it could be about the people around you as you're brought up. If your parents are criminals or have poor moral standards, then you could argue that it's more likely that their children will be criminals because of the moral standards that they've been given. As well as this, parents can be abusive towards their children and can give them a bad start in life, which can also lead to them undertaking criminal activity. As well as this, the people around a person as they're growing up could lead to them being criminals. If you grow up in an area where there's a lot of drug dealing or gang activity, it could be that you are more likely to become criminal because of those who are around you and the opportunities that are afforded by them. As well as this, we can look at poverty. People may become criminals because of poverty, simply because they're stealing in order to survive. We could also look at poverty as being a cause of crime, because those who are poor are unlikely to have the same opportunities or advantages as those who are well off. Therefore, those in poverty may undertake criminal activity in order to get hold of things that they feel like other people have and they deserve. Emotions like anger, greed and hatred are also a big cause of crime. If people are unable to keep their emotions under check, then it can lead to them having outbursts which could cause others harm, or it could lead to them not considering their actions properly before they undertake them. Mental illness is another cause of crime. If people are mentally ill, then the way that their brain processes information and the way that they react to particular situations is not the same as it would be for somebody without that mental illness. This can lead to them undertaking criminal activity because of their reaction to particular situations or because of the way that their thoughts are processed. Addiction to particular substances is also a cause of crime. We can talk about this in terms of drug addiction or alcohol addiction. This can lead to crime in a number of ways. First of all, drugs and alcohol are expensive to buy. And if somebody has no money, they may well steal in order to get hold of the money to be able to buy those drugs or alcohol. Alongside this, when they're taken, people are no longer able to see the world in the same way and may well react badly towards particular things or do things which they think are a good idea at the time, which then turn out to be illegal. The final cause of crime that you need to know about is opposition to an existing law. This could be when people undertake criminal activity in order to oppose the government in their country or a particular law which is in place within their country. A great example of this could be civil rights protesters in America during the 1950s and 60s who often protested by breaking the law but only laws that they saw to be unjust. This led to the government having to change the law and the abolishing of segregation in America. It's time for us to look at another one of our key rules. This one is a hadith, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that everyone is as equal as the teeth on a comb. This means that in the eyes of God, everyone is the same, no matter what their gender, age, race or religion is. Write down how you think this teaching could affect a Muslim's view of a hate crime. Define a hate crime first, and then tell me how Muslims would see it and what Muslims would think about it. Pause the video now and answer the question. Time for another keywords test. Give a definition for the principle of utility. 
The principle of utility is the idea that an action is right if it encourages maximum happiness for the maximum number of people affected by it. One important question that you need to consider for your exam is whether all criminals are evil, whether we can sometimes see reasons behind crimes being committed that we would see as justifiable, and whether all crimes are evil or whether some things are just bad. All crime can be seen as a bad thing, and to decide whether a crime is evil, we need to be able to consider whether it is worse than just being bad. Things that can help us to decide whether an action is evil or not could be whether the action is intentional, does the criminal intend to do the thing that they do, or is it something which is a byproduct of something else? Whether the action is conventional, is it a normal thing that has taken place, or is it something which you wouldn't expect somebody to do? And whether the situation taking place makes the action understandable. Does the situation that a person is put in make the action that they do something which you can completely understand? Think about those different conditions that we've just given to decide whether an action is evil or not. And in a table on your piece of paper, write down three reasons why you would say that all criminals are evil and three reasons why you would say that not all criminals are evil. Pause the video now and when you've got six reasons, play the video again. Here are some ideas that you could have had. We'll start off with the idea that all criminals are evil. First of all, we could say that by being a criminal, you are aware that you are breaking the law and you're putting your others in danger. This makes you an evil person. If you intentionally put others in danger, then you are a bad person and you could be considered to be evil. Secondly, the Quran instructs Muslims to cut off the hands of thieves and to kill those who commit murder. Such harsh punishments that can't be taken back must be reserved for people who are evil. So these instructions from the Quran suggest that criminals are evil because they deserve to be punished so badly. Finally, many crimes such as murder and theft go directly against instructions given by God. In the Ten Commandments, God says do not kill and do not steal. Going against God is an evil action and therefore all criminals could be considered to be evil. On the other side of the argument, we could say the devil tempts people into doing the wrong thing and people are weak and listen to the devil's temptation. They're not evil, they're just weaker than the devil. We could also say that some criminal actions are done for the greater good. For example, Martin Luther King broke the law when protesting against the unjust segregation laws in America. We wouldn't want to call him evil, but he would have been a criminal at the time. As well as this, when crimes are committed because a person has a mental illness or is addicted to a substance, then we could question whether we can really blame them and call them evil. If the crime is committed because of something beyond their control that's going on in their mind, then would we want to call that person evil or would we want to have sympathy on them and give them treatment? Finally, people sometimes commit understandable crimes. For example, stealing when in poverty to feed their family. These people we wouldn't want to call evil at all, as the actions that they're doing are completely understandable. Next we need to look at the aims of punishment. This is what we hope to achieve by punishing a criminal. What do we hope the outcome to be after the criminal has been punished? This can be divided into five different parts. I want you, as we go through, to attach a religious teaching to each one to support it. So the first one we need to look at is protection. This is the idea that laws exist to protect people and their property from dangerous criminals. For example, we put people in prison if we think that they're dangerous, that keeps them away from the rest of society and ensures that they're safe. The next is reparation. This means making up for what you've done. For example, cleaning the area if you've done graffiti. The next is really important. Deterrence. This means that criminals should be put off committing crimes in the first place or they should be put off committing that crime again. The next one is retribution. This is taking revenge on the person who has committed the crime. An eye for an eye. For example, life in prison or capital punishment for a murderer. Finally, we have reformation. This means that punishment is given in order to change the person for the better, so that it can become a part of normal society again. Pause the video if you need to, to try and attach a teaching to each one of those ideas. Here are some of the teachings that you could have used to support the aims of punishment that we gave. The 
first one was protection, protecting other people from that dangerous criminal. An obvious teaching to use for this could be the sanctity of life, the idea that life is special because God has created it. This means that life should be protected, and protection obviously goes towards doing that. The next is reparation. Reparation could be seen as the fixing of broken relationships. Jesus repaired the relationship between God and man through his crucifixion, teaching Christians that they need to atone for any sin or crime committed. The next is deterrence, stopping people from wanting to do a crime again. In Islam, uh, it encourages punishments that deter people, such as the Quran stating that the hand of the thief should be chopped off, as for the thief, male or female, cut off their hand. The next is retribution, the idea of getting revenge. In the Bible, it says an eye for an eye. And finally, we have reformation, changing a person for the better. Jesus said, love your neighbour. And it's a kind and caring thing to help somebody change for the better so that it can be part of normal society again. Time for another keywords test. What is the definition for community service or community payback? Community services, unpaid work for the community, given as a punishment to criminals. This will be for a set number of hours. Think about the aims of punishment that we've been looking at and write a PEE paragraph to explain which aim of punishment you think would be the best. Try to think of it from a Christian or an Islamic perspective and use the sentence starters on the screen to help you out. Pause the video now and play again once you've finished. Now that we've looked at the aims of punishment, we need to look at the types of punishment that can be given to criminals. There are loads of different types of punishment that criminals can be given in various different countries around the world. We need to concentrate on four main ones and look at the advantages and disadvantages of each. The first we'll look at is community service. Community service is when criminals have to do unpaid work to help the community, for example painting public buildings or picking up litter. As we go through the ideas for and against community service, I want you to write down at least five bullet points that give you an idea of arguments in favour of and against this form of punishment. First of all, we could say that community service is good because it helps criminals value the community more as it allows them to see the work that goes into it. It also allows people to continue to work if they have a job, which is what you would want to happen to you. We could use the golden rule to back this up saying treat others the way that you want to be treated. The community benefits from the work as it is done for the community and people still get to see their family, which is a kind thing to do. We could use love your neighbour to back up this idea. On the other side of the argument with community service, we could say that many people argue that community service is too soft. Criminals will just do the crime again if they're not scared. So that could be a harm to special lives going against the sanctity of life. We could also say that it goes against the idea in the Quran of chopping off the hand of the criminal. As for the thief, male or female, cut off their hand. It certainly seems soft in comparison to amputating limbs for a crime committed. Sometimes community service is not suitable for the criminals it targets and fails to work because they don't appreciate the work that they're doing. Community service is reliant on criminals realising the errors of their ways by realising the value that they're adding to the community and how much work goes into it. If you have people who are not likely to do that, then community service won't work at all. Finally, we could use an argument that goes against really all forms of punishment. Jesus tells people to forgive 70 times 7 times, and really this would go against any type of punishment, as forgiveness means not punishing people. The second type of punishment that we need to look at is corporal punishment. As we go through this, make sure that you make at least five bullet point notes again to give arguments for and against this form of punishment. Corporal punishment is when the criminal is punished by causing physical pain to them, for example, whipping them. As I go through the arguments, work out whether they're in favour of or against corporal punishment and write them down on either side of a table. The first argument that we could give is that the Bible tells Christians whoever spares the rod hates their children, but one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Another argument is that religion encourages it. In the Quran it says to chop off the hand of the thief. As for the thief, male or female, cut off their hand. 
One argument could be that it breaches human rights and is a barbaric way of punishing criminals. It's harming someone, going against the sanctity of life, and teachings like your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Corporal punishment cannot be taken back if a criminal is wrongly convicted. For example, if you've chopped off someone's hand, they can't miraculously grow it back when you find out that they were innocent. Corporal punishment is no longer used or allowed in the UK. And finally, corporal punishment teaches criminals a hard lesson. It shows them that what they did was wrong and that they deserve to be hurt for it. The Bible says an eye for an eye. And it's likely to be the case that criminals see the error of their ways very quickly because they're scared of that pain happening to them again. I'm going to look at another one of our key rules now. This is a Christian key rule from St Paul. and It says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. This means that every person is important and valuable because there is a part of God within them. I want you to think about how this teaching could affect a Christian's attitude towards corporal punishment. Pause the video now and write down an answer to that question in terms of corporal punishment. The next type of punishment that we need to look at is prison. Prison is a place where criminals are locked away from society for the crime that they have committed. On your piece of paper, make a table for and against the use of prison. I'll go through two different arguments on each side. Pause the video after each and work out which side of the argument it needs to go on and write it into your table. The first two arguments that we'll look at are these. It protects people from dangerous criminals, which is kind and caring. Jesus said, love your neighbour. By locking people away in prison, we're keeping them off the streets and ensuring that they can't harm other people. Offenders' families suffer and relationships often break down, tearing families apart. This is not a compassionate thing to do, and Muslims believe Allah is Ahraman, merciful and compassionate, so they should try to be the same way. Many prisoners re-offend. At the moment, the figure is about 47%. This means that after they've come out of prison, around 47% of people commit other crimes which mean that they need to be convicted and sent to prison again. Prison gives offenders the chance to reform through education and counselling available there. The Golden Rule says treat others the way that you want to be treated and you will probably want to be reformed as many criminals are through going to prison. Prison can be seen to act as a form of retribution for victims and their family. The Bible says an eye for an eye and taking people away from their loved ones and taking away their freedom could be seen as just revenge for crimes done to others. Prison is expensive. It can cost £40,000 per year per inmate. That money could potentially be better spent on other things, such as the NHS or education. You could also argue that it would be better spent on preventing the causes of crime in the first place, for example, trying to get rid of poverty in particular areas. It's time for us to look at an exam question. This is a four mark question and so you'll be taking four minutes in order to do it. The question is, explain two contrasting views in contemporary British society on the use of corporal punishment. In your answer you should refer to the main religious tradition of Great Britain and one or more other religious traditions. Now there are a number of things going on in this question that we need to keep in mind. The first thing to mention is that when it says contemporary British society, all it means is modern day British society. We don't need to worry about those words. Any arguments that we can give are likely to be applicable here. The next thing that we need to look at is the fact that it asks us to refer to the main religious tradition of Great Britain. This means that we have to talk about Christianity in our answer. Then, the fact that it says and one or more other religious traditions means that we have to talk about another religious tradition. For us, that's going to be Islam. The final thing to bear in mind is that it asks for two contrasting views. This means that we have to give views on both sides of the argument on corporal punishment. We're going to use PEE skills to do this, and you need to spend four minutes on the question. Pause the video now and make sure that you time yourself for four minutes to answer the question. Here's a potential answer that you could have got to that question 
See how close yours is to this. Christians think that corporal punishment is acceptable as it shows tough love towards those being punished and teaches them a lesson. In the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, it says, Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. This means that discipline by corporal punishment is good as it teaches people a lesson. On the other hand, Muslims may disagree with the use of corporal punishment as Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught that Allah is kind. He said Allah is kind and loves kindness in all matters. This means that Muslims should try to be nice to others and hurting them with corporal punishment is not a kind action. We can see that in both paragraphs we followed the PEE structure. We've got a clear point at the beginning saying whether corporal punishment is good or bad. We've also got a Christian teaching and a Muslim teaching telling us why we would believe that. And finally, we've got an explanation for that teaching, linking it back to corporal punishment. As long as you've done this in your answer, and the teaching that you've used makes sense in terms of corporal punishment, then you should have got it right. The only other thing to bear in mind is the fact that we've talked about Christian views and Islamic views. Remember, we had to refer to the main religious tradition of Great Britain and one or more other religious traditions in our answer. Our views are also contrasting. So the first view is saying that corporal punishment is acceptable, the second that Muslims would disagree with it. Next we're on to another keywords test. What is the definition for a hate crime? A hate crime is a crime committed against a person because of their race, gender, sexuality, religion or disability. One thing that you need to be aware of for your GCSE is the principle of utility. This is an ethical principle put forward by Jeremy Bentham. It's a philosophical idea that an action is right if it encourages maximum happiness for the maximum number of people affected by it. We can apply this to things like the death penalty. If the death penalty means that innocent lives are saved and many people are protected and kept happy, then it could be seen as a good thing and should be allowed even if it's not pleasant for the criminal. I want you to, on your piece of paper, explain whether you agree or disagree with the principle of utility. Try to think of problems with the principle of utility as well as the advantages of it. Aim to use teaching in order to support your view of it. The final type of punishment that we need to look at is the death penalty or capital punishment. This is killing a criminal for the crime that they have committed. On your piece of paper make a table like the one on the screen. On one side you're going to put down reasons why capital punishment should be allowed. On the other side reasons why it should not be used. Pause the video and aim to give at least four reasons on each side of the argument, attaching a teaching to as many reasons as you can. Pause the video now, and when you have eight reasons on your table, press play. Review the points you have, and add any ones that you think are useful and that you'll be able to remember for the exam. In favour of capital punishment, some of the ideas you might have had are, in the Bible it says an eye for an eye, a life for a life. This is in the Old Testament of the Bible, and it basically means that if you've killed someone, you deserve to have your life taken as well. In Islam, in the Quran, it says do not kill unjustly. A justifiable reason for killing could be seen as taking the life of a murderer as they've taken the life of somebody else. Capital punishment could also be seen to act as a form of deterrence. If people are afraid of being killed because of the crimes that they've committed, they're much less likely to commit those crimes in the first place. Capital punishment can also be seen as a form of justice for the victim and their families. It acts as a form of retribution and again fulfills the idea of an eye for an eye. In the Quran, it says that the punishment for a murderer should be for that murderer to be killed. Although forgiveness is encouraged in the Quran, Sharia law states that the murderer should be killed. Executing a murderer will keep society safe, as a dangerous person is no longer living in society and is a threat to others. This could be seen to fulfil the teaching of love your neighbour. Capital punishment means that the country doesn't need to spend money on keeping criminals alive in prison. This means that that money could be spent better on hospitals or schools. And finally, in the Bible it says, Whoever sheds the human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. This means that if you kill somebody, you should be killed as well. Arguments against capital punishment could be as follows. 
In the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, it says, do not kill. We could also link to this the sanctity of life, the idea that all life is special and sacred, no matter what. Both of these teachings suggest that capital punishment is bad as it goes against these ideas of never taking life. Another teaching that we could look at is turn the other cheek and forgive. This was something that Jesus taught others to do and directly contradicts the idea of an eye for an eye. Jesus in fact said in the Bible, you have heard it said an eye for an eye, I tell you now, turn the other cheek and forgive. Islam also encourages forgiveness. Another idea that we could look at is the question of whether you're better than a murderer if you kill as well. Gandhi said an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And it does seem to make us hypocritical if the punishment that we give for killing people is to kill them ourselves. People may get executed unfairly and for crimes they did not commit. There are numerous cases of people having been executed and then further evidence coming to light which proves them innocent of the crimes they were convicted of. In the Quran, it says if anyone kills a person, it would be as if he has killed all of mankind. This again goes directly against the idea of killing anyone for any reason. And finally, Jesus taught that you should forgive 70 times 7 times. Capital punishment is certainly not a forgiving thing to do. Another one of our key rules is the fact that Jesus said love your neighbour. This means that we should act in a kind and loving way towards everyone, no matter what. Referring to this teaching, explain what a Christian might think about the use of prison to punish offenders. Make sure that you refer to both love your neighbour and prison in your answer. Time for another key words test. What is the definition for deterrence? Deterrence is an aim of punishment that should put people off committing crimes in the first place or committing them at all. Next we need to look at the types of crime that there are. Think of as many different types of crime as you can. Try to give a religious teaching with each that shows why religious people would be against that type of crime specifically. So give the type of crime and then a Christian view or an Islamic view or both of each type of crime you can give. Give yourself five minutes, pause the video and think of as many as you can. These are the types of crime that you have to know about for your exam. Review or add to the teachings that you had for each one of the types of crime. If you've got more than we have on the screen, then that's great. The first we need to look at is theft. This is taking another person's property. The Christian view of theft could be taken from the Bible, which is do not steal in the Ten Commandments. As for the Islamic view, it says in the Quran, as for the thief, male or female, cut off their hand. Both these views obviously go against the idea of theft and taking other people's property. Another type of crime you need to know about specifically is murder. This is taking another person's life intentionally. The Christian view, again, could come from the Ten Commandments. Do not kill. In terms of Islam, we could use the teaching, if you kill one person, it's as if you've killed all of mankind. Both these teachings directly go against taking the life of another person. Finally, we have hate crimes. These are crimes committed against people due to prejudice, for example, racially motivated crimes. Any religious idea here that shows that everybody is equal will go directly against hate crimes. In terms of Christianity, we can use the teaching, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Jesus Christ. This comes from St. Paul. In terms of the Islamic view, we could use the teaching from Muhammad, peace be upon him, we are all as equal as the teeth on a comb. Both of these teachings show that everybody should be treated equally and therefore hate crimes would be bad. The final thing that we need to look at is forgiveness. This is the idea that a victim can let go of ideas about revenge and move on from the crime committed against them. On your piece of paper make a table on one side saying criminals should be forgiven and on the other side reasons why criminals should not be forgiven. Try to give two points on each side of the table. Pause the video now, and when you have four answers, play again. Review your answers and add any that you haven't got. On the side that criminals should be forgiven, we could say that by forgiving a criminal, you're giving them the opportunity to move on and reform. Without forgiveness, people may never get past 
mistakes that they have made. We could certainly say that this is a loving thing to do and follows teachings like love your neighbour. We could also say that if we expect others to forgive us, we should forgive others first. The Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. If we want God to forgive us, we should be prepared to forgive others as well. Finally, forgiving criminals means that the victims or families of the victim can move on from the crime committed against them. Holding a grudge against someone can be very emotional, and if you forgive somebody, you no longer need to do that. On the other side of the argument, we could say that it actually doesn't matter whether we forgive or not. God is the only one who can decide whether the criminal is forgiven, and the only one who can truly forgive. We don't need to forgive, as God will, or will not, as the case may be. Forgiving criminals seems to let them off for the crime that they've committed. It's important that a criminal knows that what they have done is wrong, and if we just forgive them, they may end up doing it again, or doing it to somebody else. For many people, retribution is an important part of punishment, in order to see that justice has been done. Forgiveness takes away the chance of retribution, and therefore means that many victims may not think that justice has been done. Time for another keywords test. What is the definition for retribution? Retribution is an aim of punishment that takes revenge on the criminal for the crime committed. We now need to look at some religious ideas about forgiveness. On the screen you can see different religious teachings, all of which have something to do with forgiveness. Pause the video, write each one of the teachings down and write a meaning next to each one. When you've given a meaning for all of them, play the video and see how accurate your meanings are. Pause the video now. Review your ideas about what each one of the teachings meant. Make sure that each one is accurate and that you're happy to explain any of them in your exam. The first one that we looked at is from the Lord's Prayer in the Bible. This is forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. This means that if we want to be forgiven by God, we should forgive other people as well. The second one is another teaching from the Bible. This is one that Jesus used. It says, forgive 70 times, seven times. This is Jesus telling Christians to forgive others as many times as possible. It's not just talking about forgiving people 490 times. It's saying that you should always try to forgive as many times as you can. In the Quran, God is referred to as al Ghafur, the all-forgiving. For Muslims, this means that we should forgive as well, as it is what God would do. Also in the Quran, it says, let them pardon and overlook. Do you not wish that God should forgive you? God is the most forgiving and merciful. This is very similar to the one from the Ten Commandments that we used earlier. If we want to be forgiven by God, we should try to forgive other people as well. The next is a hadith from Muhammad, peace be upon him. This says, pardon each other's faults, and God will grant you honour. This means that if you are able to forgive others, God will reward you for that forgiveness. Finally, the last teaching is from Jesus as he is being crucified. When he is nailed to the cross and is about to die, he shouts out, Father forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Even when Jesus is wrongly killed, he is willing to forgive those who are doing it to him. This means that Christians should try to follow his example even if that forgiveness is very difficult. The next of our key rules is a Christian key rule that Jesus used. Forgive 70 times 7 times. This means that you should forgive people as many times as you can. I would like to know what effect this would have on a Christian's view of punishment. Time to try another one of our exam questions. This is a 5 mark exam question. It says, explain two religious beliefs about forgiveness. Refer to scripture or sacred writings in your answer. For a five mark question, remember that we need to do two PEE paragraphs. Two different reasons are needed and religious views need to be used. It doesn't matter if you refer to the same religion in both of your PEE paragraphs. And as long as the two views you give are different and the teachings given are different, then it doesn't matter if you're on the same side of the argument as well. We can only spend five minutes doing this question. So pause the video and take five minutes to write your answer to the question. Pause the video now. 
Here's a possible answer that you could have had. See how yours measures up to this one. Christians think that forgiveness is a good thing to do as it follows the teachings of Jesus. In the Bible, Jesus tells his disciples to forgive 70 times 7 times. This suggests that forgiving others is the right thing to do, no matter how many times you have to do it. Muslims may also think that forgiving others is a good thing, as it is what Allah has told them to do. In the Quran it says, pardon and overlook, do you not wish that God should forgive you? This shows that if Muslims want to be forgiven by God, they should be prepared to forgive others. You can see in this answer that we've used a really clear PEE structure. We start off with our point and we start each one of our paragraphs saying which religion we're going to be talking about. We also say what side of the argument they're going to be on. In both cases we've talked about the fact that forgiveness is a good thing because that's the easiest thing to use in terms of this question. We then go on to use a teaching and specify where each one of those teachings comes from. In the first case the Bible, the second case the Quran. And then finally, we give an accurate explanation that links it back to forgiveness. In both of our explanations, we use that word forgive or forgiven. Make sure that you're doing the same things in your answer. The final one of our key rules is a really, really important one for this topic. We've got two key rules here, one of them from Christianity, the other one from Islam. In the Bible, St. Paul says, submit to those in authority. In the Quran, it says, obey Allah, obey the messenger of Allah and those in authority among you. In both of these cases, it means that you should obey the people in authority wherever you live. I want you to try to explain what this teaching means for religious people in terms of capital or corporal punishment. Now we just need to go through some religious teachings that you could use for your exam. On each one of the slides for Islam and Christianity, write down three teachings that you think you'd be able to remember that you don't already know to be able to use in your exam. We'll start off with Islamic teachings. In the Quran it says, be just for it is closest to righteousness. This implies that you should always be fair and just in the way that you deal with people. It would imply that criminals should be punished fairly. If you're asked a question about justice, this is a really good one to use to be in favour of using justice to punish criminals. In the Quran it says, if a person kills anyone, it will be as if he killed all of mankind. This means that murdering one person is equivalent to killing the whole world in the eyes of God. It goes directly against murder, but as well as this, you could see it as going directly against capital punishment. If someone is killed unjustly, the Quran says their family are entitled to satisfaction. This could be forgiveness, compensation, imprisonment or death. This demonstrates the fact that Muslims can punish murderers in whatever way the family of the victim see as bringing them satisfaction. It could mean that the death penalty would be justified, or it could mean that using prison to punish murderers would be a better option. The Quran also says, O you who believe, Obey Allah, obey the messenger of Allah and those in authority among you. This illustrates the fact that Muslims are instructed by God to follow the rules given by people in charge of the country they live in. It means that wherever you live, you need to follow the laws of that country and means that being a criminal is always wrong. Finally, the Quran says, as for the thief, male or female, cut off their hand. This shows that if someone is found to be guilty of stealing something, they should have their hand cut off. It could also be used in favour of corporal punishment, as it is a clear instruction in the Quran to harm people who are convicted of offences. Now we'll look at Christian teachings about crime. The first is a really simple one from the Bible in the Ten Commandments, do not steal. God instructs Christians not to steal in the Ten Commandments, and it is therefore seen as something which is going against God if you are convicted of doing it. Also in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This implies that when a crime is committed, the criminal deserves to have the same done to them in punishment. It could be used to justify capital punishment. St Paul said, submit to those in authority. St Paul instructs Christians in the Bible to follow the people in charge of the place where they live. You should always follow the rules of the country you live in. The Bible says, do not avenge yourselves but leave it to the wrath of God. This could be seen to imply that we should not be the ones to punish those who have done wrong, 
we should just leave it to God. If a criminal is guilty of a crime, it shouldn't be up to us to find that person guilty. God will know and will send them to hell. Finally, Jesus said turn the other cheek and forgive. He also said that you should forgive 70 times 7 times. There are clear instructions in the Bible from Jesus that forgiveness is always the best policy. This could imply that criminals shouldn't really be punished and should just be forgiven instead. Time for our final key words test. What is the definition for reformation? Reformation is an aim of punishment where the punishment is given in order to change a person for the better so that they can become a part of normal society again. The last thing I want you to do is a final exam question. This is a 12 mark exam question so you should be spending 15 minutes on it. There are a number of things that you need to remember in order to do your 12 mark exam question successfully. The first is that we're looking at both sides of the argument. You need to make sure that you remember to look at reasons that would agree with the statement and reasons that would disagree with the statement. Try to give religious teachings to support as many of your points as possible. But if you can't think of a religious teaching for any of your points, make sure that you develop it in some other way. Try to explain as far as you can. Make sure that you are answering the question by linking each one of your points back to the statement. And finally, make sure that you're peeling all of your reasons. That means we need to give a point, an explanation, some evidence, explain your evidence, and then link it back to the question. If you can add additional evidence, then that would make your answer even better. The question that you're looking at is criminals should always be punished for their crimes. Evaluate the statement. Pause the video and spend 15 minutes giving it as much as you can. You're aiming to do two Peel Plus paragraphs and two normal Peel paragraphs with a conclusion. Here's a possible answer that shows you the structure that you should have been using in your own. I haven't written a full answer, so don't think that this would get 12 marks. A particularly strong reason to agree with the statement could be the idea that there is an explicit instruction in holy books for criminals to be punished for the crimes they have committed. In the Quran it says, as for the thief, male or female, cut off their hand. This means that if someone is found guilty of theft, they should be punished by having their hand cut off. Similarly, in Christianity, in the Old Testament, it instructs Christians to take an eye for an eye. This seems to suggest that when a crime occurs, the criminal should be punished so that they feel the same pain as the victim they harmed. Both these teachings show that criminals should always be punished for their crimes, as the instruction to punish them comes straight from God. Although holy books do suggest that punishments is good, they also teach that it is not always the best way to deal with criminals. Christians and Muslims both place a large amount of emphasis on forgiveness, and this would suggest that punishment is not always the best option. The Hadith says, pardon and forgive each other's faults, and God will grant you honour. This shows Muslims that by forgiving others, they will be rewarded by God. Alongside this, Jesus teaches Christians that they should turn the other cheek and forgive suggesting that even if they have been hurt by someone, Christians should make sure that they forgive them. Therefore, criminals should not always be punished, as religious people are encouraged to forgive them instead. Let's just look at what's going on in this paragraph, so that you make sure that you're doing the same things. The first thing to say is that we're always making a clear point as to what side of the argument that we're on. Here, our first sentence is telling us, that it is not always the best way to deal with criminals to punish them for their crimes. Then we explain that immediately. We talk about the fact that there's a great amount of emphasis placed on forgiveness. Next we need some evidence, and we can see very clearly that I'm naming the place that each piece of evidence comes from, from the Hadith and Jesus, and that I'm giving clear quotations which back up the point that I'm giving. Notice here that both of these are linked to the idea of forgiveness. I'm not giving new evidence to look at a new point and backing up the same point that I've got. Finally, I'm explaining both pieces of evidence immediately after I've given them. This makes it clear that I know exactly what I'm talking about and how it relates to the question. The last thing that we need to make sure that we're doing is linking back to the statement. The statement is criminals should always be punished for their crimes 
and I'm making it absolutely clear how that links to my statement and why my answer is going to be a valid one. Make sure that you're doing all of these things in your answers as well.